Who's asking these questions? Um, one of the people in my Wednesday group. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Elliot. Before we get started, you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. And if you would like to help us out with supporting the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our content and would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help you would be able to give us would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about a question that um, that we got asked for some DMing advice, and um, we're just going to answer the question and see where that spirals off for a greater discussion. Um, so here is the question that got posed to us. I've, I'm kind of uh, consolidating some, some information here uh, to make it a little bit more uh, friendly for being read on a podcast. But it goes, hey, I've got some DM-related questions. I'm running Dragon of Ice Spire Peak for some friends, and they ended up killing someone and admitting it to the mayor. Do you have any recommendations on how to proceed? Should they be imprisoned, or should it just be blown off? Um, Some additional details about this. The player characters are all level 3, and the players themselves range in age from 9 to their 3. 30s. Um, and another detail is that the uh, the nine year old in the group is the son of the DM, and that is the person who uh, killed the person, the the NPC, and then admitted it, just straight up admitted it to the mayor. So, Elliot, um, have you ever been in a situation where the player characters just straight up murked somebody who you didn't expect them to murk? Oh, you know, just about every single game. Yeah, I think this is probably one of the most common occurrences that happens in D&D. I, I would argue that it happens more often than the player characters killing a goblin. I'm, I'm You know, I really liked this topic. Um, I, I think that, I don't know about you, Clayton, but... My my story about even coming to, to, to gaming in the first place was I really enjoy um, it as a as a as an excuse to world build and just to be creative. So, you know, I, I, I'm sure that like everybody who's played who's ran a game or enjoyed being a DM, everybody, you know, spends way too many hours uh, just kind of just kind of creating new worlds and places to play in. And laws and rules uh, of a society are one of those topics. It's a rabbit hole that world builders can go down that can be a lot of fun, but also it can be a little, It's. Uh, I think that it will find in our discussion, I think it's a little more complicated than simply, well, they broke a law, so we got to punish them. Like, for instance, I guess my first question would be like, yeah, okay, obviously murder is one of those uni- universal laws, but um even though kind of in most human societies, uh, murder is a crime, at least non, you know, sanctioned by religion or, or government. Um, but the consequences of that has ranged throughout history. So um, my first question to the, uh, to the DM would be, well, you know, what, what would be a standard punishment for this crime in this world? And do you know? And if not, point out that that in and of itself is an opportunity to be creative in a game. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this question doesn't just pertain to a historical fantasy game. This is literally a question that comes up in every single game I run, regardless of system, regardless of time period in which it's set. And really the the time period in which it is set or the the equivalent time period um has a lot to do with how I would answer this and to and what I would have the consequences of this be. Just right off the bat, I I do think that there should be some sort of consequences. I don't think that this should just be something that is ignored. Um, I personally play role-playing games, and I play characters who I really want the world to have consequences for my actions. I want there to be some sort of repercussion of why 
of me choosing to do a particular course of action and then there being a logical result of it. And really what defines logical, again, depends on the time period. Um, you had said like, um, well, what what is the world's, what is the, what are the local laws? What is, what is the punishment for doing for something like this in this time period? Um, throughout most of human history, the types of punishment for this was the code of Hammurabi, the, the, um, the wrathful God, the whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, stripe for stripe, life for life type of thing. And that is really the way that a lot of human history treated murder but that's not fun as a an, in a game to have your player characters come up on a murder charge and oh you're guilty so we're going to kill you that's that's just not fun unless you are you and the players are wanting a game where we you all become outlaws and you're constantly on the run and uh you're evading the the consequences of your actions where that is the point of the campaign some considerations um that I, that i would think of first in the moment and then between sessions is um a who was this person that got killed uh, i don't know that we have that that detail but that there's they can only be certain categories there's there's a there's a vital npc which is just kind of inconvenient for the dm but then there's just rant you know just murder like uh, murder, what's the, well, murder hobo style, I guess, was how I would think of it. Just, did they just kill some random person? Um, and three, it was, a, or could it be a killing that was kind of meant to be a, a difficulty for the DM? So if the player was killing killing someone almost intentionally, you question their motives, that they were just kind of being a nuisance. That's That, to me, is the worst kind. So I think in that situation, if there's a player who's being problematic and makes running the game not fun for you or uh, not fun for other players, um, then that need that player needs to get the old you know, heave-ho. Um, and in this case, you can't really do that. So yeah, you would take a pretty heavy-handed approach to show the players, I don't tolerate that. But um, you know, in the first case, if they just killed an NPC, if they had a, a reasonable motive, and then they just got caught. I think that is a that's that's a bit of a different situation. Uh, players come to games to have fun, and it's I don't think it's totally unreasonable to uh, for a player to you know occasionally err on the side of uh, you know taking the hard line because we so often don't get that chance in real life. So I would just say if it's a problematic player, throw the book at them. Um, if it's not, then you know, it's an opportunity to make an adventure, right? Uh, does that make any sense? Yeah, it definitely does. I don't have the full details, but I have a sinking, sneaking suspicion that there is a situation going on here that I have personally been in so many times that it has, for me personally, it has become a trope. Um, whenever you have a group of players playing the game for the first time and this guy has his nine-year-old son playing the game, and I'm pretty sure this is his first game. When you tell somebody that in a role-playing game you can do whatever you want, they don't believe you. And I have had it happen multiple times where the way that the player who doesn't believe you that you can do anything, the way that they test that is they just just go up and shank somebody in the, it doesn't matter the the circumstances. I had a player several years ago, first time he had ever played a tabletop role playing game. He, the first action he did whenever I introduced the uh, the players into the campaign, this was session one, first five minutes. The first thing the player told me after I described the scenario was he said, "I walk up and I stab." Well, it was a merchant at the time who was right there in front of him, he just said, I, I walk up and I stab him to steal his stuff. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. And, yeah, I've had so many examples of running first-time players in, and they just go off like, like loose cannons. It is a trope. And because it's a trope, I think that, you know, as DMs we need to, uh, I think in those situations, it's sometimes it's important to not kind of overreact. Um, 
because it, uh, it, because at the end of the day, it, it is a you can do anything you want. Uh, a lot of this falls on how do you deliver the game to the players in the first place. Uh, say you start a game off in a rural area, and there's not really much law, I guess you could say, and 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 then they come into a a much bigger town or more populated area. It's important to let them know there are laws. Like for instance, I'm running a, a game at the moment uh, that's set in ancient Rome, and you know, as part of researching the game, you know, ancient Rome had plenty of laws, but they didn't have any police force. It was a very strange kind of system that they had. And in that case, you know, that was something I made sure to deliver to my players because um, it, it was so alien to our normal world. You know, uh, if you're if you're if you're playing a very alien world or uh, say like a fantasy setting, a D and D kind of setting, you know, you can kind of make it up. You are right, Clayton, that you know, in history, you know, murder for eye for an eye, right? But there, you know, there were there were institutions like Weregeld and in other societies where you could murder somebody and you would just simply owe a, a large sum. You could get by with, you know, if I killed your brother, you know, your family could demand half my herd if I give it to you, and I'm that's my punishment. Um, use that up as an opportunity to show them that's not okay by putting the whole party in a dangerous position as a result, maybe through a trial or a foot chase with some guards or. Uh, the family themselves comes to avenge them. Maybe it doesn't even happen that same session. In this case, they've told an authority figure. I assume that there's some sort of laws. So uh, you could just throw them in jail. But like you said, Clayton, that's no fun. Why not invent uh, a, a trial they have to go through or some sort of uh, uh, way to redeem themselves by giving them some sort of uh, uh, give them a quest, I guess you could say, in games, right? Yeah, exactly. Um like you mentioned the fact that in your Rome game, there's no police. Um, I learned not too awfully long ago just how recent of a development the idea of police actually is. Yes, for sure. Police did not exist before the 1800s. Yeah, and, and so that in and of, I don't know how many times, I'll give you an example when this happened one time where I think in the moment the DM was right to be pissed, but historically like you were saying the reaction just kind of wasn't realistic well uh, I, I don't remember the situation it was a fantasy game a D &D, i think it was just a vanilla D, D game and me and my party we hadn't i think the i know the situation was it was a particular group of players that had not played together in a long time so that it was a very like up euphoric kind of moment and uh i can't remember exactly what it was but um i know we found ourselves in this small village of, it was specified a village not a town not a city, a village, and there was a couple merchants, right? And so uh, one of the party members just decides to rob the merchant at, you know, in the middle of the day, uh, in order to uh, just to get what they wanted. They couldn't afford it, so they just they just killed the guy and stole it. You know, the DM was pissed that he should have been. That's not that's a shitty move. But in this situation, he solved it by just waves and waves and waves of guards attacking us. I mean, it was just it was almost like something out of Monty Python. It was. You know, you are you walk out the door and there's five guards. We kill those five guards. We turn the corner. There's five guards. We turn and run away from that corner. There was five guards down the other way. And it's like half, you know, this whole town is nothing but armed guards all the time, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, don't do that. <laughs> That's my first advice. Don't do that. Because there just aren't going to be that many guards in a town, you know? I have committed that sin as a DM. Um, I had a player who... Um... In order to create a distraction, quote, uh, distraction, he had the bright idea of um, setting up an effigy of the local uh, local leader in front of City Hall, setting it on fire, and then when people showed up to gawk at it, he dropped a fireball on them. See, why would he do that? The player was an asshole. The player, not and, and the character, but the player as well. I, only, I, only, I have a rule, I only kill steel. If I'm playing in a game and I want to just be a, the, the, I think the most rude thing you can do is kill another player. I, I have boundaries. I only, oh, I guess we can't say his name. Oops. Our friend. Yeah, I think it's pretty rude to kill another player um, as well. I I will allow playing a, or killing a character, but killing a player is just off the table for me. I'm just making a joke. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, in, in, but you, I mean, honestly, that does lead to a point, you know, if, it, again, it, it, it is all situational, but hey, we're talking about it on a podcast, right? So, you know, 
if the player is simply if 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 the DM if that's a problematic player, you're facing a different situation if this guy this player that's killed this person is a known problem or a problematic player and those types of things. In this situation, if it's a first timer or a newbie, uh, it's important for players to know that we're it's it's not do what you want game. It's simulated reality game, and so. You know, if you're a DM, um, it's your obligation to keep things realistic to the world. You know what I mean? So it wouldn't be realistic for there to be no consequences. Um, what would what do you think some of his solutions could be for consequences? What do you think, given this situation, what we know, um, what would you do as a DM? Well, I really like your idea of doing of having some sort of a, a financial payment be made to the family of the person of the person who was killed person who was wronged that's historically how most situations were resolved um if we and if we're in a magical setting um like you had also said sending them on a quest if you've got somebody in town who was high enough level that they could cast a geese spell um to compel the player character or player characters to go on some sort of a quest then you can be that heavy handed and literally force the players to do it. I think that as long as you are giving some sort of um, some sort of a consequence that they that the players can see that, yes, this is a game where I can literally do whatever I want. But if I choose to do something shitty, I'm going to have to deal with that. It's not just um, ha ha. It's a game. Nothing happens to me. You know, yeah, I mean, I think, too, you know, it, it, it all, this all depends on how you are as a DM, obviously. But, um, yeah, I think one, in, one, one interesting path that you could walk down would be, you know, say that this is the type of, say that this player has played or has made this character and is playing that character the way they were intended to. And this character is just kind of a sociopath, the, cha- the, the cliche chaotic evil kind of dude. And if you're okay with that as a DM and you're not afraid to let this let the story kind of go where the players want it, you could even you know, introduce like a, an element of drama into it and like faint like you're going to walk down the normal path, like put them on trial and all that good stuff. But then like have a mob of the people attack them, you know, uh, and, you know, police, maybe not so historically common, but angry mobs seeking justice that's a much more common historical version of uh, of, of justice. So, um, and of course, that all that backs the players into a, a corner as well. Like, how far down this rabbit hole of evil are we going to go? Are we just going to murder all these, murk this whole town right here? Um, that's an interesting, you know, in my that's an interesting decision point in my opinion. Uh, you you kind of give the players, you know, the opportunity. Hey, if you want to, if you this is how you want to play this game, here we go. You know. You get you ready to put the sword to this whole town, frankly, uh, and if they are, then that's going to affect how you run the game. But uh, that doesn't mean that has to not be a that could be a very fun game, a very fun session. Another fun way you could do it is drawing on a couple of other historical examples, um, like in the American Wild West, like the James Younger Gang. They had parts of the country or counties in the country where they were law-abiding citizens. They went somewhere else to do their uh, their robbing and their pillaging and all of that. Um, and the uh, the like Billy the Kid and the regulators they did the exact same thing. They would they would be like in Texas and just do a whole bunch of crimes, murders and stuff like that and then they would flee across the border and in, into Mexico where there they were practically saints because they uh they were very generous with the spoils of their um of uh all of the stuff that they had uh, either stolen or the the deeds that they had done like by killing these people who were uh were debatable whether or not they were actually good men or bad men i mean they were going back and telling the story that they had killed all these bad guys i mean that's a whole nother way that you could handle this, especially in a D and D setting where a lot of times the game is is a travel game where you go from place to place to place. Maybe the fact is that they they just 
leave town and just ling leave a string of of murders or uh or crimes in their wake and they know that for at least a long time they don't ever have to come back here that's a great opportunity to pull, to bring in your element of what you said earlier of somebody having uh like paying a bounty for them to be brought to justice or for them to be killed there can be a, you can bring in bounty hunters and stuff like that into the game and that's going to that's going to make the game even more dynamic because now the the player characters are being hunted you know exactly you know and this is i mean it i'm a broken record it's so important to know the game you want to run and and i think that sometimes dms and i can maybe fall a little bit prey to this sometimes dms forget they're a player too and um you know if you collect a party that um uh, is undermining your fun you know that doesn't mean that they're doing it wrong and that doesn't mean that you know i've seen it too many times dms sitting on their high horses I've been this DM where I sat down to run a particular game and then the players don't want to play that game. And when the players aren't invested in, you know, your your story or what you're putting in front of them, uh, their actions in game are there. There are a signal. They are a signal to the DM. It's like, you know, if you have a player who is in a location you've set and they're just killing random people, well, that player just for sure told you that they don't give a shit about this place. Um, and, you know, in my experience, that's why I typically for, I typically don't recommend um, DMs run the travel game, the fellowship game, at least not at first, uh, not to say travel's bad or whatever, but I think it's, it's when players feel like they're grounded in a location where they matter, that they have built up background in, and they care whether or not what their reputation are is in this town, because if they were to do something like what's happened, you know, they could, if they were to never be able to come back, because that's always an option, well, then they won't have any of those interactions. They won't have any of those connections that they have built up in that town. And, you know, if a player is just acting like they just don't care, well, I mean, believe them. And um, if that's not the game you want to run, there's nothing wrong with at the end of the session or talking to that player one-on-one, -on -one, especially in this case where it's a kid. I mean, you're, that's kind of your job in this situation is uh, you've got a young, new player teaching them how to play. Um, you just, But even if it's an experienced player, you just say, hey, man, you know, what's the deal with that? They, you know, and if they kind of just express like, I don't give a shit or that's just kind of, I'm just that kind of player, man. Um, there's nothing wrong with just saying, hey, look, when I sat down to run this, hey, this is kind of where I was planning on going. Um, you know, just randomly killing people, just so you know, that's really kind of put a damper on my night. You know, if you would be um, a little more thoughtful, I'd appreciate it. There's nothing wrong with telling, just telling them, hey, that's that's kind of not the game I want to run. Do you guys still want to play? I think that's fine. Yeah, and abs absolutely. But I will also say that um, I know myself well enough, and I've been in the situation before where... Um, those are all very good pieces of advice, Elliot, that you gave. But in the heat of the moment, I am not fucking thinking about that. I am, I am just stewing on this guy is fucking up my game. <laughs> I've learned that about you. <laughs> I have noticed. <laughs> I really need to have a cool down period afterward to basically get myself rational again. I I'm desperately trying not to let this conversation spin out, but, uh, yeah, I've definitely, I, I'm definitely moving more towards the just take it in stride game. Most of the, my game creation anymore is so focused on world building because, in my opinion, you know, when, when a when a DM sits down to write a narrative, they're 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 kind of you know putting a lot on the path they want to go down, and there's not a whole lot of lot in any other direction. That's just kind of how you have to do it. Um, I've moved more towards a let's try to really restrict the location. That's the menu of options, I guess you could say. Imagine like putting them on an island. When you're planning a game, find a way to really pigeonhole the geography so that you can basically so that you can make a game that isn't that your fun isn't so hinged on the completion of said tasks. Because like you said, Clayton, then this shit happens and it just ruins your whole freaking day. It's like, oh my god, why did you just kill that person? They had, you're supposed, they were supposed to like them. That's that's the person with the secret knowledge. 
Or, why the fuck did they kill them? I really loved that NPC. I worked, I had stats and everything. These friggin' players don't appreciate nothing. Uh, that is a, that's a bad, that's a bad feeling road to walk down as a DM. But you can't help it when you, when you spent all this time creating this path for them to follow and they just want, that all they want to do is seem to screw you over, you know? That feels bad. Yeah, I try very hard to make it explicitly clear to all of the players what my expectations are for the game at the start. If we are going to be in a game where this this starting location or like the second location that they encounter in the game is going to be their home base and we are expected to always spend the campaign there, that's part of my social contract with them. I am telling them, hey, we're playing a Planescape game. 95% of the time your characters are going to be in the city of Sigil. This is a this is something that is a con- a contingency for this game. You guys are agreeing to this con- to this idea by participating in this game. And if players break that, that's when I lose it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, here I've done it. We've gone off the rails a bit. Uh you yeah, I completely agree. And crime but this exact topic, what we're talking about, is a good way to, um, ha- you know, having a bit of a game plan or some experience running these situations, how you respond as a DM, because he's not wrong. It's a pivotal moment in your game. You have, you know, we've illuminated some paths to walk down, but the DM has to choose which path they want to walk down. And whatever happens, it needs to be. I tell you what, now, I'm, which, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. In my opinion, if you're a player, and, or if you're a DM and you're dealing with a moderately problematic player, because a, a really problematic player, of course, the answer is get them the fuck out of your game. But uh, a moderately pro- problematic player, you can punish that player and they'll be fine. This is an old teacher trick. Uh, they'll take the consequences and they'll like whatever. You know, they'll break out of their jail cell or they'll, you know, have a character that dies and they'll just make a new one and who's the exact same. But if you punish the party... If the consequences have a disproportionately negative effect on the other players, you'll find that as a DM, quickly the other players are going to start policing that player for you. Um, and uh, that player is going to definitely hold the regard of their co- their fellow players uh, higher than even the DM, for sure. Yeah, and there's a lot of different ways that the other player characters can have the consequences of this uh, be felt. Um, some things that I like to do is suddenly um, there's no inns in town that are going to accept you. Uh, everybody, all the innkeepers are saying, I'm sorry, we don't have any rooms available for you. And it doesn't take very long for the player characters then to uh, start looking at the problem player a little bit side-eyed. Hey, yeah, what if the mayor in this situation, the mayor could say, huh, okay, well, I tell you what, I'll just make it go away for that fighter's giant magical sword, you know? Put them in a situation where to cover it up, it doesn't even really harm that player because he doesn't, but the only per, you know what I mean? Pick a thing that's precious, or just, it could just be as simple as a, a big fine, but a fine much bigger than the individual player, you know? Think about all the, say they just got a bunch of loot from a something that they've done, worked hard to do. Um, take it from them. Make them lose that or put them at that point. It's like, okay, well, you want to stay in this town now? The cost is going to be all that work. And next thing you know, the other players are going to be moaning and growing way before the DM. Yeah, especially giving them a fine that is too much for the one player who committed the offense to pay for on their own that they have to then ask the other player characters, hey, uh, can I borrow a little bit? Uh, that gives the other players in the party a little bit of leverage over that particular uh, character. But but I've also been in situations where um, the other members of the party, they, they aren't the strongest in personality. And the this player who is doing all of this stuff, they're probably the most they're probably the most forceful uh, voice at the table. And uh, if the other players aren't comfortable enough in doing in giving that player their um, their natural consequences, it it just becomes a a cycle of the problem. That's 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 the problem I was in with the the example I gave earlier of the 
character who dropped a fireball in town square as a distraction. The uh, that particular player was definitely the uh, the mover and shaker of the campaign in more than just uh, more than just being an asshole. He he was the more dominant player at the table, and the other players at the table they they just they were they were very casual players and they didn't they just wanted to play the game. They didn't want to have to deal with all of this extra stuff. And that's more common the case than in this situation. This guy's actually got a pretty simple situation to fix. Um, the the one you're describing is far more common and far more problematic. <laughs> I don't I, even in that situation, I would push back a little bit. I feel compelled. Um, you know, again, as a DM, you know, it could just be that the players, maybe the players just don't mind the players' behavior that much. I mean, and like I said, you know, I can be annoyed by other players. I mean, every game, every game I'm in, you know another player or something happens and is annoying. It's just inevitable. But um, when another player's actually impeding my fun, then um, that's a really strong compulsion. I mean, it's not, I'm not trying to blame the victims here, I don't guess, but there, there is something to be said about, you know, if the other players aren't objecting, I'm just going to assume that they think that that's okay. And that shouldn't, you know, makes you, it makes you wonder, you have to ask yourself what kind of game am I running again, right? Why is this particular player just murdering everybody? Um, maybe and maybe you can tie in a major plot point that follows that behavior, right? Yeah, and there is a fine line between giving that particular player a plot point and suddenly making the game all about the consequences of that one player's actions. Um, it's a fine line you got to walk to make sure that um, you aren't rewarding with attention the problem behavior that you are seeing hey can i just toss out another just random thought uh challenge for dms in this situation is um you know when you're in a fictional world and players and and you put other people in those fictional worlds and and they want to solve the their problems with violence why aren't we letting them uh i know that sounds silly and yes and we've talked about the problems and story and all that stuff but to the greatest possible extent, I, I I feel like like I like killing people in role playing games. I really I really enjoy it. It's one of the things I bring in there. The, the main reason why I dislike the the problematic player who kills everybody, it's not the fact that they're just using violence to solve their problems because that's kind of a core component of the game. Uh, I hate combat dominated sessions. So to me, it's more of a problem, not because they're killing people randomly. It's the fact that they're forcing unnecessary combats that just are such a pain in the ass to run. And and when you are constantly in these minor combat scenarios in game, um, it just che- it, it makes being in combat cheaper and less fun. And I I just mainly feel like combat should be meaningful and fun, and just being chased by a bunch of guards to because you stole an apple or something, I don't want to fight a combat for that. And if you as a player make me, that's how I get pissed at a DM, <laughs> as a DM. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, but I, th- I think that that's, uh, that's that mindset is particular to certain players. I personally hate having any combat that's not a, that doesn't either forward the story or forward the setting. Um, and those types of combats where... Um, the, the local guards are just ganging up because the, the player stole a bunch of shit. Um, yeah, it does enforce the fact that there's consequences for actions, but like, I don't know, some, some players just, all that they want out of the game is, is a fight and to, to reward them for this negative behavior. Um, I mean, for them, it is a reward because I'm, I am getting to, have a fight because I did the shitty thing. Yeah, and that's why it's important to view it as problematic behavior, either whichever way you fall on it. If you're just, if you don't like players just being murder hobos in your games, because that's boring, because it is boring, um, I think it's important. But also, again, like we were just talking about the combat thing, uh, that's a problem because it's constantly dragging other players who maybe aren't com- as combat focused into a constant slog. Uh, I mean, it, it'll end the game, in my opinion. Usually what happens is that that uh, unresolved or undealt with well, that usually just kind of peel, you know, 
peters out the game. Um, what would be some creative ways? Of, I, I was curious, trying to think of some fun avenues to go down with this thought. Let's just say this is the problematic player. He's this guy's obviously not going to throw his, you know, throw his kid into the clink. Or maybe he will. Um, but if you say you did have that problematic player and you were really wanting to like show you, show him that this is not the way I want to run my game, I, I just had a thought. How funny would it be if the if this town just happens to have this gelatinous cube pit? That they've just always had a gelatinous cube in this town, and it's just that's their common practice of murder is that you know just having this guy just carted off, tossed in the pit, make a new character. <laughs> the the town's garbage disposal that doubles as the yeah. means of execution. I mean, in that way, it's it's it, it's fun. You're forwarding the world because uh, you're introducing an interesting fantasy element, and you're giving punishment. There you go. Don't fuck with my game, players. <laughs> I think that would be that should be a last ditch effort. Um, if they've been in the situation, if you if they've been in this situation multiple times, I think that in this particular instance, it sounds like it's it's a first offense. Um, absolutely not. Uh, never go that extreme for uh for first offense. But uh, if it got if it gets to that point, then yeah, uh, the player characters eventually get to somewhere where they aren't the baddest dudes around and uh, somebody knocks them down and serves up some justice to them. Yeah, or you could go the Titus Pulo route. If anybody, I'm a huge fan of the HBO series Rome, uh, so everybody go check it out. But one of the characters starts off, spoiler alert, uh, in prison in the, uh, in the army, and he's about to be, I think he's, he's supposed to be executed, and next thing you know... Uh, uh, a superior soldier gets sent on a mission that's basically a suicide run in this guy's mind. Next thing you know, he's unlocking old Titus Pullo, taking him with him because he doesn't want to. Uh, he doesn't want to lose another, you know, a worthy soldier. And and there you go. So you could have an avenue where, yeah, you get you divvy out the consequences. They're in jail, and then you give them a quest that's very dangerous as their chance to get out. I think honestly, if we're just to address this guy's issue, that is how I would do it. You know. Yeah, for Storm, performing some sort of duty or service is um, is definitely my uh, my go to. Ooh, twist the knife a little bit too, and make like somebody in town the jailer or the whatever, like the brother of that person, or like uh, introduce some other element that the players have to deal with. You know, the weeping family, you know, as they leave town or something like that. Like in, engage the heart as well. Yeah, having a. a having the dead characters kids tossing rotten fruit at the player characters on their way out of town. Yes, exactly. Have you ever seen a DM handle this badly? I mean, I guess I just gave one story. I wasn't the DM in the endless waves of guards, but somebody you know was. And uh how have you ever seen a, a DM handle that situation just the exact wrong way? Yeah, I have been the DM that sent the endless wave of guards. And I've also been the DM who, um, yeah, you go around the corner and um, suddenly there are elite guards there. And yeah, they are, they way overpower the party. Yeah, boo on that. I mean, other situations, like to to go a little macro uh, and think about when you're creating a world. I know that a lot of the people play in worlds, but everybody who's read a D&D book knows that when it comes to laws, and those types of things. I mean, first of all, that's another thing that's a challenge in this situation is, yeah, this is a black and white, but there are so, every society has had so many laws, so many customs, so many taboos. Um, you know, that is good, in my opinion, a lot, that is a good, that situation is actually good fuel for story because as a way to advance the game, you might engineer a situation where they act, where they have to offend somebody on purpose it, it, from the DM's perspective to introduce this interesting aspect of this world. Uh, it might be that a particular animal is sacred that they don't know about and they, they try to, you know, they get caught eating some or whatever. And next thing you know, they're, un but they're getting, you know, falling victim to a crime they didn't even know existed, you know? Um, I think thinking deeper about laws in the first place when you're running a game 
not only does it prepare you for these types of situations, but it's one of those ways that can help immersion so much because laws are so present in our society and we just take everything in our society for granted. If you just make a, if you just skin our world with uh, fantasy elements, um, that's often a really boring world to play in. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind if you are skinning real world laws and putting the drop, just dropping them down into your. Uh, especially a historical fantasy game. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the fact that most of our law enforcement comes about because of modern communication. If you don't have modern communication, nobody in the next town over is going to know that you've committed any crimes. I mean, the mur- that's, that's the thing. I mean, uh, if you, it doesn't take too deep of a dive into bizarre history to, uh, to find that that is exactly how things happened for you know that was not uncommon like it wouldn't have as a merchant in a more medieval time or non or pre-modern times i mean if you happen i mean you knew you were in danger for you know you know getting robbed uh, by a customer is so common to this day um and you know you, you really need to put those thoughts into your head uh prior to session 1 i mean the idea that a party would just murk a a dude to steal their shit it's a perfectly common human impulse especially in a fictional world um you know i've, I've read about like there were they found they found all kinds of bizarre stuff people bandits that would hide out and live in caves and would have just the most bizarre uh collection of stolen goods because they did it for decades you know that was very common just go hide in the woods find a cave and a road to, to rob it it was a common profession <laughs> It's why we have the term highwayman. Are there any laws that you've observed in games where DMs either overemphasize them or underemphasize them? And they can even, I like, think even like, it can, like mundane things too. Um, well, I'm thinking back of that episode of Star Trek, The Next Generation, where Wesley basically crushes some flowers and he gets the death penalty. Yes, love it. I, you know, th- reading about Rome, a, a bizarre thing. A bizarre rule is, uh, now this was post-Caesar, but one of the things Julius Caesar did, it might have been Augustus, but uh, made it all uh, commerce traffic had to happen at night because in Rome, it, the, the streets were just not big enough to accommodate daily business and commercial traffic. So if you were to ro- say you're in a, in a fantasy world that has a similar law, just running afoul, of, you could run afoul of the law just by carrying a cart into town, you know? Um I think curfews were more common than people I see running games. I think that if you're a small village, uh, especially in a dangerous world, um, the idea of people just walking around at all hours of the night would not have been as common as I think we assume. Yeah. And like ideas like the Sabbath, where it's illegal to work on a particular day of the week. Uh, that's something I've used in some of my games and always the like, the moment player characters get outside of town, they are glad that they don't have to abide by that because for some reason, player characters hate the idea of taking a day off. For sure. For sure. As a DM, days off scare me too, but that's neither here nor there. Let's see. What are some other laws? I'm trying to think of common ones, either bizarre ones that you can introduce or um, common ones that we just don't like noise complaints. I mean, I guess who would you complain to? Um, pets. Certain animals in the ancient world were loathed. If you had a dog in Rome, then you'd be a weirdo. They'd probably eat it. They hated dogs for some reason. A particularly gruesome one, if you're if you're just trying to put your world into a more savage state of mind, a one interesting uh, consequence that they used in Rome, and this was reserved mainly for uh, sons who've killed their fathers in that specific situation called patricide. The Romans, if you were convicted of it, more uh, their most common punishment for that was the uh, accused was tossed was was sewn into a bag with a starving dog and like six vipers, and then drug from the forum to the Tiber and then tossed in the Tiber to drown. But the whole way being drugged, they're getting bitten and attacked by these by these animals. It was vicious. Um, another thing that could be considered a crime is just talking to the wrong person like addressing a 
like somebody who is of higher station than you, just either addressing them without some sort of affectation or just straight up giving them eye contact when you're talking with them. Absolutely. And like, these are all things I believe that doesn't need to be expressly told to the party. Like you don't have to just enumerate every law because in this situation, say you're on the fellowship portion of your game and they don't know much about this town, that would be part of the fun. But give them a give them some sort of hat nod, you know. Give them an opportunity to interact with some some NPCs. Have the NPCs make offhand comments or something of that nature. Like, oh Mon Mon Queen Anne over there, you know, she you know, that kind of thing. Um because you don't that that is a fine line but it's a common complaint for me of, of a lot of D and D uh, fiction uh, is they just have worlds that um, don't re- don't really resemble. They're not almost. It's almost that like they're not alien enough because our minds aren't accustomed to thinking in ancient ways. You know. Yeah. Um, another th- thing that I thought could be a well, it was a serious crime was um, uh, not not. Uh, tilling your field or not doing um, the whatever your um, your annual taxes were, however, whatever form that took, that was a very serious crime because the uh, the local lord didn't get his wealth to then kick it up the chain to whoever he owed feel, fealty to. Absolutely. So you could have something like that where um, every time you, your characters go into town, since if you're if your characters aren't from that town, you've got to pay some sort of a tax in order to just get through the gate, and that goes back into the idea of like maybe only at certain times can somebody come through the doors. Um, like I, a lot of um, places I, I believe like in the Middle East, um, a lot of the bigger cities there they had certain time periods where you just they didn't open up the doors after dark. For anyone and you basically were either stuck outside or you had to go through a very small side door that um wasn't big if you were a merchant wasn't big enough for your cart full of goods yeah in rome uh there was a funny little incident where one after they expanded the vote to include more italians they found that the romans i'm sure they found evidence but they were all they became suspicious that non-citizens were voting politically like foreigners and things traitors um because it was really difficult to prove your identity back then so they just made it illegal for any foreigners to be in town so just like blink of an eye the biggest metropolis in the world imagine being a poor you know for poor sailor traveling to you know trade some goods in rome's port and just all of a sudden you show them they're like oh yeah you're not allowed to be here <laughs> that would suck I, I you know i think as far as this guy's situation, we've got him pretty well set up. Are there any situations that we haven't covered? Any uh, any implications of laws? Uh, any scenarios that are common that have to do with running afoul of the law? I could, really, it's always murder. Why is it always murder? Murder is as easy as breathing. I mean, theft is kind of assumed. I think that that it's just a reflection of well this in this world i can do anything and so the first thing most people think of is not i want to just take everything that's not nailed down but um i want to end a life because that's one way or another everybody has like either on purpose or accidentally stolen something at some point so you kind of already know what that's like but really there aren't very many people who have actually murdered somebody so that's something that is Something that can be done in a game that, in a lot of ways, cannot be done in the real world. Yeah, that's true. Um, I guess so. Um, have there ever been times that you've committed a major act of, of criminality in a game and felt justified, even if the DM didn't like it? Um, when have you been the murder hobo, Clayton? <laughs> be honest. I really have never been the murder hobo type of player. Um I would say the worst things I I've, I've been play I played thieves like compulsive thieves. Um, that's probably the worst that I've ever done. Um, I more than any other class I've probably played paladin more than anything. It's hard to be that type of player whenever you're playing the paladin. Um yeah uh, I'm I'm a hundred percent a murder hobo. I will not 
I will not even attempt to deny it. I, I, I can be a bit of a problematic player at times. I can't think of an instance where I took it too far. But sometimes you never know because the game just stops. And maybe you sometimes you wonder, well, was it because I did that thing? <laughs> I may have to take that back. Yes, I have played the Paladin who um, basically just used um, Detect Evil to determine everybody who was wrong and was that um, basically that tyrant with an iron fist type of character. I'm sure that in that campaign, I pissed the hell out of the, the DM. You know, that is a good I, that is a good thought experiment. If I'm a paladin and I deal death for my god, and, I'm, and that's my job, and I have detect evil, why are paladins just, why is it not their standard act to just do a detect evil, you know, basically on an entire town? And then just systematically rid the town of evil people. Why is that not a more common thing? Well, you see, in Planescape, there's a faction called the Harmonium. And there are certain individuals in that faction that, yeah, that is their whole deal. Is uh, the Harmonium and also another faction called the um, the Mercy Killers. That They are all about justice in one form or another. And uh, some of them do do that. Some of them have actually shifted over to evil because they have uh because of their actions by doing that. There's an example, a story I want to tell, an example where I was the hobo and of course I'm going to paint it from my perspective. The DM was great. Um you know him, I'll tell you off pod. Uh he's a great guy, great DM and we all got really hopped up and he gave us a really good backstory about this town that we were starting in. So I made a local uh, like fighter guy who was very like I tried the idea that I had in my character was he was just like a hometown hero he was just very uh very a man of the town and uh all of a sudden things start going wrong in this town and he's going to like I go to the he goes to the guards and reports this like evil behavior of a of, of like a thieves guild or something like that and they don't care and then uh I start, I start, you know, attacking them or start to undermine the thieves. And all of a sudden I start getting heat from the guards because they're in league with them. Then I go to the mayor and I get all the way to the top of the food chain. Finally tell the mayor, hey, all this, you know, these guys are stealing a bunch of stuff on the docks. And he essentially does it. Oh, no kidding. You dumbass are doing it for me kind of thing. So I killed him like right there on the spot. And it was it, the situation painted in I just painted was a little bit in my favor. It was extremely inappropriate in that situation. It was a way overreaction considering what the guy told us because like he had reasons. It put the whole town in jeopardy or whatever. But I was so frustrated as a player by that point that I could just not break through to get any help. It seemed like it, there was no avenue in the game that anybody was going to care about this wrongdoing. And so I as a player and then. I got frustrated and then I put that in my, 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 and I think we resolved it, but I tackled him and jumped, you know, took him through a window and fell two stories and I landed on him and he died. That was, <laughs> that was how I did it. And it was, it was one of those moments where everybody just kind of looked at me and was like, whoa, dude, that was not cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, having a player who is frustrated, uh, probably throws just as much wrenches into any given game than anything else. Every and and that that is an impulse. I, I am I have a problem with that as a player. I've had, I try to I'm trying to work on is that when I get frustrated, that is what happens. I either put myself or the party in my in danger just to create some sort of traction in whatever situation we have. Usually, when I get frustrated, that's when you'll see my characters just okay. I'll go to the front of the line, or I'm just going to walk in that room. Usually, it's because people are dithering, or there's a puzzle we can't figure out, and there's clear danger ahead and it's like oh f it let's just go if i die i die you know yeah nothing derails a campaign more than either a player who is bored or a player who is frustrated yeah truth and that's why it's important to really kind of have your game set in your mind because you are going to run into those players you are going to frustrate because they're like every player is going to get frustrated every player is going to you know everybody wants their time in the spotlight in my opinion and even if that's not direct, it's like their turn. Anytime that it's you're not being engaged directly, um, you're ticking your frustration meter a little bit. And the longer that goes on for any one player, inevitably they're going to be, you know, but it, but not all, I mean, not every session is going to be for every player. That's just something we have to remember as players. Yeah, and something I constantly have to remind myself as a DM because I've had 
this problem since I started is um, I am never being as obvious as I think I am about the story, the plot, the intrigue that's going on. I obfuscate things way too much and I don't give enough hints and it invariably leads to frustrated players and characters who just don't know where they can go, what the next step in what their next step or what their options are for dealing with a particular situation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, and that's as, as a DM, I mean, creating as a DM, um, that's something that I think we all fall victim to because that's why D, there's, that's why there's a strong division between dungeon masters and players. Usually the same people run occasionally get to play but mostly are put in the dmc it's because we like to imagine worlds and imagine situations and a good idea can balloon really quickly and you know in this last not that i just ran a one shot so it doesn't count but i will say uh, i i kind of had to be drugged to the table as a dm sounds silly because the game's probably done but i'd kind of sold the idea of me wanting to play run a game and then i kind of soured on the system a little bit but I'd already kind of crossed the Rubicon. And so um, I walked into it so underprepped. I had a map, I had some figs, and I had about two sentences <laughs> written down. And, I'm st- and I've am and i kept it that way. And uh, I've, I was amazed at how much time... You can never underestimate the amount of time the players are going to take to do a thing. So the simpler you can make some... You can always make things more complicated as a DM can throw things in their way if you think they're moving too fast but when you plan out these elaborate uh game plans um it will just astound you how stupid players can be when they don't figure it out i mean it, that you can never underestimate the inability of a party to to pick up on any sort of subterfuge or anything that's not overtly stated but i fall guilty i'm still fall victim to it almost every game i run yeah same here um, do you want to go ahead and go on to geek things or do you have any other final things you want to talk about? No, I think we've talked the, uh, the wheels off this one. I, we can do geek things. All right. You want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> I'm, I would go, I've, one of the things that I like to do in my spare time related to gaming is, um, I like to con lang. I like to make, uh, imaginary languages. And if you've never been down that rabbit hole, it seems silly, but I came to it. It's going to be long winded. I apologize. Um, I came to it because when you look at ancient history and languages, you really find out they just so much about a culture by their basic language. Their topmost hundred words can really determine a lot of things about a, a culture. And so, when you're world building, you're trying to make something unique. If you start from the if you if you start imagining, you know, what kind of communication do they have? It forces you to then think about like how do they make a living, right? So, anywho, long story short, I'm going to recommend Polyglot. Anybody who's like that or wants to give that a try, there's it's a program that is all-encompassing that gives you all the tools and all of the considerations for doing that. And it's been a big, it's just been a really nerdy thing I've been into lately. I've been nerding out. You can even like make your own fonts and upload your own fonts and actually type in the language. It's really cool. Uh, and it makes it really easy and streamlined, which is not, calling is not that. So anywho, Polyglot, it's awesome. Very cool. Um, I've got two. Both of them are semi are definitely related. Um, the first one is a um, a podcast that I've been listening to called "It's Probably Not Aliens." Um, this uh, podcast goes through the um, episodes of uh, the history show "Ancient Aliens" and debunks all of the pseudo history, all of the pseudoscience that is in it. Um, I believe that I'm listening to something like episode 30 something, and I think they've gotten through the first four episodes of the series. Um, so they are they are going very deep in explaining why pretty much each and everything that Ancient Alien says is wrong, and I love it. Um, it's by the, the two hosts are... Um, uh, the host who also do the YouTube channel um, Step Back History on YouTube, and also the guy who does the um, the YouTube channel Nerd Sync. Um, I've been re- I've been listening to those episodes and been loving it. Um, if you are interested in history, in actual history, um, there's a lot of really good information there about areas that really don't get covered a whole lot. And the and 
because they don't get covered a whole lot, there's these people who are just spouting out lies. Um, the other thing that I've got is also pseudo history related. Um, it's a YouTube channel called Minuteman, and he goes through and debunks um, pseudo archaeology. Um, a lot of pseudo pseudo archaeology about um, and pseudo anthropology as well about um, the history of man. Um, so both of those, if you are interested in debunking pseudo history and pseudo archaeology um, and pseudoscience, definitely give those uh, a check out. You know, it takes the super nerd to get super nerdy about correcting false history. I love it. I love it more than fake history. All right, Elliot, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? As soon as I listen to that podcast. (laughs) This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.